Hey guys, Steve here, from Potent Ponics. Today we're going to talk about... Growing with fishes. Growing with fishes. Righty. Hopefully this is working. Let me double check here. Make sure everything is working well. On the refeed. It doesn't look like the screen is sharing. Oh, if it is, there's a little bit of a lag. There we go. Okay. Just wanted to make sure we were all working. Sorry, we just had a couple of problems this morning. And just want to make sure we don't have any kinks. All right. Well, not any kinks that we don't like anyway. <laughs> uh, welcome to the first ever virtual aquaponic cannabis conference. Marty and I have been talking about doing this conference for over two years. Um, I think we've even tried to organize something at one point and then uh, ha has some issues uh, uh, w with trying to get stuff together. So. Um, we finally are able to get this together. There's finally a large enough aquaponic cannabis community. Um, there's uh, over two dozen farms now that are commercial. Uh, on, on, by that, I mean over 2,000 square feet uh, that are, are you know, actively producing for, for uh, the medical market or recreational market. And we're going to get over all, uh, we're going to cover a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, I'm going to cover kind of a brief overview and cover some different things and, and a build out that I've done recently and some of the different techniques and methods that I've been working on in the last year to two years. Um, you know, if you've seen some of my other presentations, um, I don't want to bore you. So we try to cover some newer stuff. So um, yeah, hope you enjoy it. Um, Marty, did you want to say anything before we get started? No, I just wanted to welcome everybody again. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I'll be in uh, in and out of chat. So if you guys have questions, I'm going to try and pick those up. Um, and uh, I'll say in the other one, just to make sure people get filtered over. Um, and yeah, just welcome everybody. <clears throat> uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. There's a ton of content that's going to get dumped this weekend. So I want to give a, a big shout out and thank you to all of our speakers that are taking their time to uh, share information. So, um, you know, just give them lots of love, make sure and support them if it's uh, an option for you. Um, any of those things are, <clears throat> are going to be super helpful in putting on more of these events moving forward. And I think they're just a lot of fun and a great resource. Uh, especially for people that don't have the resources to take some of the other classes. So, um, yeah, it, enjoy um, all the to all the speakers. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, our, all of our sponsors um, donated items to give away during the conference. So, uh, in between speakers, we'll be doing various product giveaways, and we have some cool surprises and things for you guys over the course of the weekend so we're super stoked on that so we try to do something that was free and uh you know try not to you know a lot, everyone's kind of hurting a little bit this year uh or it's kind of been if they ha if they aren't hurting they're definitely been through the ringer uh so uh we figure we try to do something free and and give out a, a bunch of stuff and kind of give back to the community since we've all kind of been through a lot this year uh i know yeah. i was uh, part of the year in africa and ended up back in the states uh, uh, <laughs> as one example yeah for sure and, and everything that came in from sponsors uh, is getting passed on as gifts and giveaways. So it's, you know, it's truly a, a free and open event. So, um, you know, big shout out to Steve also for organizing all of the guests and reaching out to everyone, um, putting everything together. So appreciate your hard work as well. And uh, yeah, stick into it. Thanks. Awesome. Well, um, and we'll get started here. So this is just some pictures of the last year of, of some of the stuff I've been doing. You can see some some really nice dual root zone uh, hydro, uh, DWC roots there, uh, trying to help people adapt existing facilities. We got an awesome, cute little frog there. We found one morning while doing some top watering in the greenhouse. Looked down and uh, about about keeled over laughing. And then uh, just want to show some of the you know incredible living soil that we can grow is, you know, we've had mushrooms bursting out of the pots on almost every single day at the one grow I was working at this year. And you could go in and find anywhere from half a dozen to four dozen different mushrooms uh, growing in the greenhouse at any one time. But, but it just goes to show when you have tree frogs and mushrooms and all types of things that can survive in your grow, 
you know, you're doing things organically and sustainably in a way that, that that's provably sustainable and provably not toxic to the environment. And there's, you know, provably uh, a way that you can show just through what's going on in the garden. Um, oh, hey, there is no uh, uh, pesticides being used. There's no harsh chemicals being used because none of this stuff would happen if we were. <laughs> So what is aquaponics? Well, aquaponics is growing uh, plants using fish waste and the mineralization process from that fish waste and fish manure in order to uh, feed your plants and, and you know other things that you may be growing. Uh, some people also incorporate mushrooms as well. Uh, and wine, uh, wine caps and some others do quite well in, in the right type of setup with aquaponics. Uh, we, in my, the particular method we're gonna talk about is hybridizing living soil with aquaponic, traditional aquaponic methods, and we'll get into that a little bit more in depth. Uh, plants filter the water for the fish, uh, mainly pulling out the different nitrogen sources and some of the other nutrient sources that can build up over time and become toxic to fish, and, and allow those uh, fish to have nice, healthy, clean water again um, by, by filtering out those nutrients so that the fish are, you know, uh, healthy and, and can sustain themselves indefinitely. Uh, this is a picture from one of the early R&D projects we did in Colorado where we were incorporating large fish tanks underneath the, the entire greenhouse in order to use them as a heat battery. Um, we could use solar water heaters to heat that water and that water would heat the entire greenhouse. And we were able to keep the greenhouse quite warm, you know, even through very cold winters in Colorado with, with very little propane, that 80 by, I'm sorry, that's a 50 by 30 by 18 foot greenhouse. And we were able to heat that with, um, you know, 80 some pounds of propane throughout an entire winter. Uh, it really is incredible when you actually hybridize it with solar water heating. Um, but uh, I believe uh, uh, Josh from uh, tomorrow will be speaking uh, quite a bit on that, on some of the different heating methods and things. I know he's been working quite hard on that. Um, uh, aquaponics can provide a, a huge benefit as well. Uh, you know, you get the additional benefit of additional revenue streams, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. So why would you use aquaponics? Well, aquaponics uses on average 18% of the water compared to traditional drain to waste or uh, hydroponic methods. Uh, or even soil, you know, if, if soil, field soil, unless you're doing, you know, really heavy sustainable soil gets, you know, has quite a bit of water usage, especially in, in the heat down here. I've been growing in, in Africa earlier this year and then now in, in Oklahoma later on in the year and uh, gets pretty hot in both of those places. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Uh, so, uh, you know, any way we can save water and not have to worry about running our wells dry so quickly um, really is a, a, something that we want to strive for and try to utilize uh, and take advantage of. Uh, we also use 10 to 15% of the supplemental nutrients and we're mainly supplementing iron, some of your micronutrients, some a little bit of calcium and, phos and potassium, uh, occasionally other things, but um, you know, we're, we're not doing a ton of heavy supplementation. We're able to run, you know, much, much, much lower nutrient levels uh, than, you know, traditional hydroponics or even soil in a lot of cases in terms of actual PPM numbers of those nutrients uh, with a couple of exceptions, but really allows you to uh, cut down your costs and, and uh, again have a mineralization and minerals that are actually generating uh, revenue via you know from the fish you know those fish are, are mineral factories basically for you that you can resell later on uh, and again additional revenue streams from the fish mineral waste and inoculated water um, uh, really helps you know keep those bills paid and cover your bills um, also, um, you, you know, if you're trying to go for clones, you, you can grow incredibly fast and we're, we're going to get to that a little bit later on as well, but, uh, you can really crank the clone production. Um, you know, you can cut two or three feet off of the plants per week. Uh, and the following week, it'll look like you did absolutely nothing to those plants and, uh, ask anybody that's worked with me. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite incredible. And we, I got pictures and stuff we'll be showing you here in a few. Um, improved uh, chemovar expression as well. We've seen a huge increase in uh, uh, chemovar expression between terpene and cannabinoid levels. We're going to get into that in a little bit more in depth. Um, but particularly against soil and hydroponic controls, uh, a little less so against living soil uh, in the terpene department, but certainly against everything else. Uh, it's kind of night and day. It's not even a competition. So we had a huge cannabinoid increase uh, using dual root zone aquaponics. Uh, we've run side by sides now. Uh, I believe Marty's going to show off some of that tomorrow, um, uh, or some of them, anyways. Uh, but uh, we've run these now at five, four or five separate businesses, and um, uh, yeah, it's pretty night and day. So against DWC and media bed only controls, we're averaging on average a 15 plus percent increase in THC. 
uh, and on average a 30% increase in CBD with some strains going from 4% to 8 or 9% CBD, uh, switching to dual root zone from straight DWC and from straight media beds. So, um, you know, the, the mycorrhizal component and, and the terrestrial microbes really plays a huge factor in um, some of these, the, the gene expression of some of these, there, there's a direct link to some of these terpene and cannabinoid expressions with, um, you know, the plant's immune system being activated by certain things that are in the soil and not found in aquatic environments, but vice versa as well. You know, we're finding an increase, uh, and we'll talk about this in the cannabinoids, but um, beta carfilene and some of the others uh, 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 specifically on the, on the terpene side are also increased immensely specifically by an unknown endophyte in the aquatic environment or an unknown beneficial microbe. So um, that's something that needs to be mapped out, but could also be exploited by soil growers. Remember that 78% of these microbes can live uh, in your, your terrestrial environment from an aquatic environment and vice versa. So, uh, you know, what works good for one can absolutely work great for the other. It just might not work quite the same way, but you can absolutely use a lot of these methodologies for mineralizing, um, you know, waste or even have an aquaculture set up that you're strictly mineralizing that waste for an, an offline soil grow uh, and basically do a giant, you know, for lack of a better word, decoupled aquaponic system using, you know, field crops and soil uh, where you have the mineral generation coming from that. And we, we actually have done that at a couple of bigger scales as well. Uh, nothing that we're ready to show off yet, but we have some stuff we're working on in Africa and, and some other places that uh, we're going to be showing off uh, probably next year and uh, near the end of the year. So uh, again, big increases in THCV and CBDV. Uh, we've had uh, oh, been able to over double THCV in certain cultivars as well using some methodologies that are only really exploitable in aquaponics as far as we can tell. Uh, potentially in hydroponics, but um, using some of these microbial methods that we're going to cover uh, uh, through some of these other people and then uh, a little bit later on in the deck as well, but um, really able to, to get a lot more control over some of these different things that previously have been kind of, uh, you know, grow for the cultivar and hope for the best, but, you know, didn't really have ways to kind of boost them individually. And we're realizing that by having access to a wider pool of endophytes and a wider pool of microbes, and by changing the balance of those, and by utilizing some of the wonderful methodologies of, of living soil and, um, and uh, uh, natural farming, that we can actually exploit those uh, to quite a larger extent, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later after the, we talk about design. So here's a picture, uh, before we talk about uh, terpenes, uh, here's a picture of um, a plant that was transplanted into uh, the dual root zone plants and then put on top of a DWC raft. This picture was taken about 18 hours after that plant was planted onto the, um, the, the raft. We planted it in the morning, came back the following morning, uh, or about, planted it about mid-afternoon and uh, came back the following morning and it already had roots that were quite large. So uh, just the, the absolute insane growth you get with aquaponics uh, and, and living soil is just unparalleled compared to any of the other methods that are done. Um, so with aquaponics, we've noticed an on average 25% increase in soil. We very rare are uh, in terpenes against soil and hydroponic controls. We, uh, most cultivars were averaging above 1.7% total terpenes. Uh, we've had quite a few tests above four and even above 7% with one coming out above 10%. Um, in terms of total terpenes and, and testing. So, um, you know, you really can, you know, push those buttons hard by exploiting every single um, methodology to, to boost those terpenes. And think about it this way. So what are terpenes? Terpenes are compounds the plant produces to defend itself from UV or from um, insects or from uh, mold or from some other environmental factor that will damage the plant. Well, it creates these compounds to either filter that light or taste bad or to be toxic to those insects or to kill the PM. Well, you need to have uh, something to activate those. You know, it has to know to make those antibodies, you know, well, we're going to call them antibodies for the sake of the analogy, but it has to know how to make a defense mechanism or defense compound the same way that your immune system has to have that. So the same way that you going and eating lots of probiotics and playing in the dirt and um, you know, taking a bath in IMO three or four or whatever it is that you want to do, um, or using some of uh, uh, Alan's awesome uh, uh, Bigfoot soap or whatever, you know, whatever your probiotic method is, um, 
you're able to stimulate your immune system and activate those. Well, with uh, by having the soil there, we can do that same type of thing by having the soil microbes, they, the mycorrhizal fungi and the terrestrial microbes are stimulating the plant's immune system to create, incre activate those genes to, to increase those terpene production and, and, and wake them up and say, hey, there's mold around. It might not be enemy mold, but there's mold around that we should probably at least make some defenses for in case a bad guy comes along. Uh, we, better, we better get on that. Um, so by, by inoculating your stuff with uh, IMO, indigenous microorganisms, both in the water and in the terrestrial zone, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, in, in a different uh, talk I'm going to be doing at the Aquaponics Association Conf uh, Conference, aquatic indig indigenous microorganisms that we've been working on collecting as well in a, in a safe way and, and a whole bunch of other more exploitable ways that you can increase those microbial biodiversity. And by doing so, you're able to further activate those genes and further um, increase that terpene production because you're giving those plants a reference point to go, hey, okay, cool. I, I, I actually, now I've seen something that's kind of like that before. We can start to try and figure out how to make a protection against that. And by giving the plants the exposure to the maximum number of microbes that are non-pathogenic, and, and by doing this in, in the case that we're referring to here is with dual root zone aquaponics, by having terrestrial microbial uh, uh, zone with soil above an aquatic layer, we're able to exploit the full diversity of both terrestrial and aquatic microbes in a way that simply does not, you don't have the advantage of uh, doing one or the other. This gives us on average 168% um, uh, more microbes in terms of total biodiversity on the root, root mass than any other grow method uh, that we've ever tested. And that there, there's actually a separate study done by NASA uh, that actually did that as well that uh, I believe um, uh, uh, oh shoot, you know what? I forgot to put that slide in this deck. But uh, anyways, if anyone wants to see that, I can give you the link to the paper. I've actually talked about it in one of the episodes of the podcast um, uh, not that long ago, 10 or 15 episodes ago. Um, if you aren't familiar with the Growing With Fishes podcast, check out the Growing With Fishes podcast. It's a great educational space for uh, aquaponic cannabis education. We have over 450, almost 500 hours of content on there. So check it out. Um, and then, uh, uh, again, if you're trying to see what the total terpene potential is for a given cultivar and you're a breeder, having a small aquaponic system where you can really force and crank them uh, and, and, and force them to, to really maximize, maximize, maximize production, you can really uh, you know, see what your plant is capable of doing and look at that from a, a more whole perspective. So what benefits can aquaponics have for a soil farmer? Well, you can use it to start off plants that might be particularly tricky. You can see in the top right there, there's a prickly pear cactus uh, that we grew from seed in a media bed because you can. <laughs> you can grow even cactus in aquaponics, believe it or not. You know, people uh, don't realize that you, you know, there really is not a really big limitation on aquaponics. Um, it's great for breeding, again, to, to find out the total expression of your terpenes, also for increasing, um, you know, turnaround. Uh, you know, if I want to bulk my plants out and really get them massive as quickly as possible, you know, you, you really can't beat aquaponics. You know, we can, out, uh, we can get two to three inches of growth, even four inches of growth, no problem. And you can see the uniformity and, and, and everything else there, uh, these clones that came right off of, right out of the bed before they're sold. So, um, it really is just a, a way to, you know, you can do even six or seven runs a year uh, with flowering uh, because of the increase in, in time, which we'll talk about later. Uh, really fast clone production. Again, the plants grow so fast and grow uniformly fast that you can, you know, create significantly more. We were producing 15,000 plus clones off of a grow space that was a little over 6,000 square feet of actually functional canopy. So, um, and we, we probably could have done even another 5,000 if we had geared the plants up a little bit more and, and spaced them out a little bit differently. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you really can create incredible revenue streams. Um, you know, you can turn absolutely enormous amounts of, uh, of feeds uh, um, of stuff into the, in terms of, of production uh, you know, that you simply cannot match uh, using other methods. Uh, mineral compounds for larger soil grows as well. So you can have, again, a large aquaponic setup that you're utilizing that maybe has way more fish population than, than it really should. Uh, you can absolutely mineralize that waste and, and either resell it or use it for your large terrestrial grow. You know, I know there's Foop Nutrients now, there's, um, which is a sponsor of the podcast. Uh, they're, they're aquaponic waste based. I know there's Fish Shit. They've been on the podcast as well in the past and a whole bunch of others that um, are, are great uh, 
uh, uh, great people and great, great products that have been out there. I know we were, when I was back at the aquaponics source, we were looking at talking with beaver farms at the time to possibly do a, a product like that, but it, we, it never panned out. But uh, again, it's super hyper mineralized and uh, can give you a, just an, an incredible amount of minerals and microbes that you normally wouldn't have access to for your you know sustainable soil grow and if you're a homesteading you know having large aquaculture set up that you can have for for food production uh, that you can always constantly have that food and feed your garden at the same time uh, and maybe you just scale it back a little bit in the winter really can be a, another great addition to your farm and to your homestead uh, and even incorporate it into a larger permaculture design um, can really increase your revenue streams. Again, you can sell that fish waste, you can sell those fish, you know, depending on what type of fish you can get into. You know, if you're looking at tilapia, you're looking at four to eight bucks a pound. But if you get into some of the more specialty fish, you can get above, 30, you know, north of 30 to $50 a pound, depending on what you're growing. Uh, some of the other people that will be speaking here, I know um, Liam Keys is, does decoupled, uh, which is, is about the only way you can with salmonids, but because of the potassium issue but, um, with them in particular, but they, they actually grow salmon up there in, in Canada and BC. So they're, you know, they're, they're in the right climate for that. I wouldn't try to grow that in Africa where you have to chill them. <laughs> but if you have the right climate, you know, adapt your facility to your climate, don't, don't fight it. Um, increase biodiversity again, if you're trying to increase your, mineral, your mineralized um, inputs for your, your soil garden, uh, you want to have better compost tea for your soil garden. It really can be a great way to um, uh, increase those things, uh, to uh, uh, increase your biodiversity and, and, and really improve the quality of your compost tea. And then again, this is the last thing, especially for the, those in California and Oregon, you always have that emergency water supply. You know, if you have to pull, throw all those fish in a cooler and use those thousands of gallons you have to, to you know, defend your home, you have that on a homestead or you have that at a commercial facility that, you know, you simply just wouldn't have otherwise. You'd have to kind of sit back and go, okay, well, let's cross our fingers. Whereas here you actually have a whole bunch of extra water and hey, yeah, maybe you lose your fish or whatever, but it's better than losing your farm. So uh, uh, that's another great thing, especially for California, where, it, you know, if you're in the right type of area, that might be very appealing to you. So fish species, we highly recommend starting with goldfish and koi. Uh, koi are much more forgiving, have a much better resale value. Butterfly and koi in particular uh, are really uh, uh, the, the bee's knees for, for most aquaponic cannabis growers. Uh, here's quite a large tilapia. I believe that one's about three years old. Um, uh, just in case you're wondering what tilapia looks like. Uh, tilapia are also great, but remember that in the United States, meat processing is a federally regulated um, license. So they can't step foot in your cannabis facility without getting themselves into some trouble. Uh, so because of that, you have to work with a third party processor or find someone you can partner up with uh, and, and have them do the processing or sell them live or, or fresh frozen. Um, or, you know, sell them under a pet license or a pet import license or import export license uh, just because of the legalities of the United States. If you're not in the United States, that doesn't apply to you. Uh, but in the United States, that, that is a problem uh, in terms of revenue generation. Um, currently, there is no legal avenue to sell meat processed fish uh, unless you go through a third party. So also, the other thing is, is that uh, a lot of states also restrict you from putting your cannabis products back onto that fish. So you can't do like a, a honey glazed smoked fish or anything like that because most of them restrict both dairy and meat. So hopefully, um, you know, once we get a little bit more federal regulation, hopefully they'll allow us to start combining those products a little bit more, um, you know, uh, um, yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, tropical fish species can also be quite profitable growing arowanas or, um, you know, some of your other larger catfish and things like that can also be quite profitable depending on the part of the world you're in and um, your local market. Uh, common aquaponic myths. Um, one great one is aquaponics can grow uh, plants uh, comparatively to hydroponics or soil with no supplemental nutrients. Uh, there's plenty of people that keep trying to promote this myth. Um, none of them get with even a third of the yields that we get with supplementary nutrients. Uh, and um, yeah, they, they, you absolutely can grow plants with no supplemental nutrients. You can grow in DWC, you can grow a media bed, you can grow in a waking bed, um, but you're not going to actually match the yields of commercial production in soil or hydroponics, and you're not going to be able to be financially viable uh, for any length of time. Um, you also have the chemistry issues of iron being oxidized. Um, manganese and molybdenum being stripped out over time 
and um, you know, just uh, uh, things just getting out of ratio. Uh, you know, you also have to adjust for pH. Um, your pH is going to constantly be going down. You're going to have to supplement for that, and that's a great avenue to add things like potassium and calcium and silica that their plants are going to uptake at a pretty rapid rate. Uh, and, and you can do that via, you know, your, your traditional methods with, with natural farming, with ferments and, and mineral inputs and, and those things, or with um, uh, our natural mineral inputs or with, you know, even synthetic minerals, as long as you don't uh, use ones that are non-fish safe. Um, and we'll talk about that near, at, at the end. Um, you want to feed your fish more to increase your nutrients in flour. This is a common myth uh, spread by one of the largest aquaponic uh, companies out there um, uh, that actually has a hemp system out there that that's, I've ended up with a lot of customers from, and we'll leave it at that. But um, there's just a lot of terrible information, a lot of, of lettuce growers and things that have jumped over that just have only been growing cannabis a year or two, and it shows, you know, their night their plants are high in nitrogen. Uh, you see this quite a lot in o uh, Oklahoma. Um, there's a, there's a, a group out there that puts out a lot of them, way too much nitrogen, stretched plants, stretched stretched, um, you know, lots of issues with with the stuff, reduced uh, trichome potential, uh, and many other issues. So again, uh, make sure that you know you're actually learning from people that have been growing cannabis and not a, a lettuce grower that's recently switched because they're still trying to figure out the nuances of it. And uh, yeah, you see it a lot. <laughs> um, uh, aquaponic cannabis uh, has a fishy taste or smell, doesn't have a fishy taste or smell. Uh, we've had uh, uh, quite a few of those uh, tests and uh, we've grown quite a bit of weed. Uh, and neither myself nor Marty or anyone else has ever had fishy cannabis. Uh, I don't think I would want fishy cannabis. <laughs> um, yeah. Aquapon yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's one of those common misconceptions, I guess, is that your your weed will somehow smell or, or taste like fish to use aquaponics. So it's just one of those, I don't know, uh, repeating questions that we get. And <clears throat> so the answer is no. <laughs> yep. Um, so uh, cannabis costs more than traditional methods. Uh, cannabis actually costs less than traditional methods when properly set up um, in terms of per run. Uh, it also has a lot more revenue potential because you're not rev re generating revenue strictly from the uh, um, fish or from the plants alone. You also have the fish and the fish waste that can be monetized. Aquaponics isn't scalable. Um, I I've built quite large facilities now or have been part of the, the construction of quite quite large aquaponic cannabis facilities, including one over 20,000 square feet. So um, there's uh, absolutely nothing that isn't scalable. Um, I would say compartmentalize though, uh, so that you're not committed. And we'll talk about that in the, in the next design section here. Um, I need to start speeding up because I'm running out of time. Uh, aquaponics can't be organic certified. It absolutely can be organic certified. So can dual root zone aquaponics can also be organic certified. Um, there's a, currently a producer in Switzerland that is organic certified and using dual root zone aquaponics. Uh, Symbiosid, I believe is the name of the company, but I might be mispronouncing that. That's Swedish, so, or Swiss, so. Um, so media beds versus DWC versus wicking beds versus dual root zones. So you can see here, there's an early side-by-side uh, -side test that was done up at um, uh, Green Relief Incorporated. Uh, they were trying to figure out if they wanted to go with dual root zones or not. And uh, they were considering switching to media beds for a bit. I'm still not really sure why they haven't, but uh, everyone has their own design ideas, right? So um, me, I worked with them back when they were first getting started way back in 2016. When, uh, right after they stopped working with their, their previous partner. So uh, media beds um, give you the uh, great ability for the plants to anchor, but they don't have any ability to add additional nutrient inputs. So that becomes a problem, especially in flower, or if you run into an issue that say you might need to fix that isn't easily plant fixable without uh, um, you know, harming your fish. DWC lacks the additional, again, lacks the additional ability to input nutrients, although we've had uh, quite a bit of luck using dual root zone pots on top of, of raft beds. Um, with some adjustments, uh, it, it's a little bit more finicky. You can have more things go wrong than with media beds. You don't have that diaphragm action that causes that increase in gas exchange that we're going to talk about. But um, um, uh, yeah, 
we'll, we'll get to it. So wicking beds, it probably can be done if you had the right soil mix, but uh, you know, we just gave up after four runs. We just had issues, too many problems with the fact that the plants start to kill off the root system right at the end of flower, the same way that they're dropping leaves, they start to, to kill off sections of the roots. Uh, so, or, you know, start to, to just not feed them as much. So that becomes a problem with how active the microbial um, community is in the aquaponic system, where, and especially in the wicking bed systems, it starts to, to eat those. And we've had some, some root rot issues right the last week or two of flower uh, and, and a lot of the testing we've done. I think you could do it, but again, uh, it, it, we've just had problems. Um, so dual root zones, flood and drain really is the best in terms of grow, grow method and growth speed. Uh, do, DWC dual root zone would probably be, you know, slightly slower than that in terms of actual day-to-day -day, uh, in our testing. Uh, but uh, uh, absolutely the, the media bed flood and drain is, is the way to go because it creates that diaphragm action and gives you the best of both worlds and gives you the best gas exchange and the most control. And we'll get, get, get on that. Um, decoupled can be done, um, but again, it has a lot of problems. You end up with nutrient imbalances and flow imbalances and, and just creates complexity that unless you're doing a specialized fish species, it really makes absolutely no sense. It adds cost. Um, you have to discharge water. It costs money to remediate in many uh, instances and, and everything else. So just it's not, it, it causes more problems unless you're specifically going after a certain fish species that you have to have it for. <coughs> Something that's lower high pH something that needs a radically different temperature than cannabis. Uh, indexing valve systems, again, you're committing entirely too many plants to one system that if you have a failure, you'll lose a lot of plants. That's why if you ever see any of my systems, we either use loops, siphons, or bell siphons, and we have no more than 24 to 48 plants uh, on a single setup. Uh, this also gives us the ability to easily um, keep the system online. If we have a power outage, I can partially flood all the beds. Uh, and, and come by if I have to, even with a bucket and flood and drain them or, you know, a, a gas powered pump and flood and drain them uh, once in a while without any kind of issue, without having to commit the entire space. If I just want to consolidate the plants into a few beds and keep them going and we don't have the whole place filled up and also, um, or if we have a, a failure, right? Again, if that bell siphon or loop siphon fails, I only have one or two beds affected versus an entire row and thousands of dollars. So. Um, that's one of the other big mistakes you see some of the newer producers using. Um, and then vertical methods, again, they just simply, I haven't seen any that have been more profitable than doing a, a square footage with, with greenhouses. And as the price keeps coming down on cannabis, you know, anything outside of greenhouses, unless, again, you're in a very cold climate or specialized climate, you know, if you're in Canada, obviously it doesn't apply. But um, if you're in a, in a warmer climate, you know, you're far better off going a wider horizontal greenhouse facility than with a vertical facility. Or if, you know, the other exception to that would be maybe California where you have the square foot canopy tax that you can kind of cheat on a little bit. So a uh, coupled multi-loop really is the best option for a large scale commercial. Um, we're gonna show this off here in a second. Allows you to adjust the number of fish tanks uh, onto a, a single bay uh, with uh, similar to decoupled without actually losing the, the full coupledness of the system and allowing that constant microbial production and constant nutrient production to, to happen while, uh, while having offline mineralization to maximize uh, mineral production. Uh, basically gives you all the benefits of the closed loop uh, and a couple of the benefits of decoupled, so kind of a hybrid system almost. So you can see here uh, in this design, we have the fish tanks here up on the right. It goes into your radio flow filters and they run into one of three or, um, separate um, uh, uh, manifolds that feed each uh, bay here uh, of the greenhouse and then one for the nursery. And we can adjust uh, an extra fish tank on or offline for veg. Uh, and then I'd still dedicate one per, per bed or even bring them offline entirely and, and, and run them with no fish tanks if we want to really finish them off at the end of flower. So this gives us a ton amount of nitrogen control while still maintaining the bulk of our, our mineralized uh, uh, inputs and, and everything else. And, and, you know, not totally disconnecting the system. We're not screwing our nutrients up and, and creating imbalances to the point where um, there, there's issues because it's constantly, you know, circulating with, within part of the system or we can plumb the whole system together if we just need to balance everything back out between runs. Um, uh, it makes it quite easy. So here is the facility beginning of construction. Here you can see painted off the lines here for the plumbing. 
trenched out the plumbing to put in the plumbing underground. These are all plumbed underground. Uh, you can see here the, the drains going up to the surface, all tapped in. There we go. Now, again, like we talked about, we don't have more than about 18 to 20 plants committed on a single area. If we have a problem, uh, there's, there's tons of redundancy. And again, you're not committed. You're not going to lose more than, you know, a couple hundred dollars or, or you know, $2,000 if you have a problem. Whereas if you had them overly committed, you're going to have all kinds of problems. You can see here there's the feed lines for each bed for the water in and then the, uh, uh, the outputs there for the, uh, the drains. Here's the, the sump tanks. Um, they were supposed to be covered top ones that we could bury in the ground, kind of like a gas tank for a gas station, but uh, they sent us the wrong 3,000 gallon tanks. Uh, so I don't know how that happened, but they, uh, they sent us the wrong ones. So this is the sump tanks that we used. Um, there they are sitting up in the, in the base there. This was all trenched out uh, with gravel. You can see there's a, a drain underneath of it that allows us to pump it out. Uh, they all run up through the front wall there. You can see how the plumbing runs through before that was backfilled. Um, how the plumbing comes in through and then, um, oh, I'm not sure if we have a picture of the inside of that building, but here's the fish house. You can see the fish tanks come across there uh, and then into the radio flow filters that then flow out into one of three outputs. And then here you can see the mineralization tank. So the fish waste uh, gets pumped by a solids flow uh, pump uh, that we just take the input line and drop it in each one uh, once every few days. And that pumps it into one of three mineralization tanks that can be mineralized uh, as needed and then mineral, uh, directly plumbed back into one of the three uh, systems. So uh, allows us to either mineralize each of them independently or do one large batch and mineralize uh, one or all three lines uh, or, or two lines if we decide to. So it just gives you a ton of control, uh, a ton of options when you're trying to switch around, um, you know, system to system or bay to bay. Uh, you can direct the nutrients without really having to, to get into it. Here's the inside of the bay. We would have, yeah. I just wanted to give you your 15 minute warning and remind you there are some questions waiting for you in the chat. Okay, yep. I have copied and pasted them in the Zoom chat, so we should be able okay. to. So this is a, a grow. Uh, there was some miscommunications on the bed sizes versus the greenhouse sizes before I got there, or we would have spaced them out a little bit better. So, uh, you know, happy to take criticism on that one. But uh, um, uh, they were supposed to be 30 foot, and they, they were 20 foot. And anyways, that's what happens when you work remotely. <laughs> um, anyways, so uh, you can see here's the, the layout. Here it is all built out everything up and running. You can see the air lines, the water lines, the fish all going, system cycling, and uh, yeah, everything all flushed out. And then uh, this is some of the early plants that got brought in from outside uh, before I took off. This is in the nursery. All right, so dual root zones critical for, for aquaponic cannabis. Um, without it, you, you don't have that level of control that really makes it easy. You can see a bunch of mushrooms up there, happy roots. Um, with this, we have a, a upper layer of soil, uh, a lower layer of, of media with flood, floods and drains with layer of burlap in between. Uh, the burlap helps keep the soil from falling into the media below. In order to figure out how much water you'd put into this upper area, you want to figure out what the saturation rate is. So let's say for the sake of argument, if I pour 32 ounces of water into this using a measuring cup, that's when it starts to leak water out of the bottom of the pot, which is how you test it. Well, I'd reduce that 32 ounces of water to 16 ounces of water, and that's how much roughly I'm going to put into this upper soil zone so that I'm not going to drip through and and harm the fish. Now, we stick to fish safe nutrients and all the stuff that I do in case there is an accident, but you don't have to. I just wouldn't do anything, you know, just avoid yucca. But that allows you to, to nutrient supplement and dose the upper part of the zone uh, and still have a flood and drain or DWC in the lower part of the root zone. And here's a side-by-side -side media bed only uh, plant versus a, a dual root zone plant. 
and you can see it's night and day. It's not even a competition. And I don't think I doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that the dual root zone plant's going to be doing much better with, uh, you know, 75% more root mass. <laughs> um, here's a plant here uh, on the lower side here that is only uh, about a month old uh, and it's got a stem approaching the size of my fist. Uh, and then we have some, again, incredible root picks from dual root zone. This one's a DWC pick. Um, I can mix it a, a lot easier to supplement. Um, you can use a lot less nutrients uh, and it gives you a lot more control. Sorry, I'm going to kind of flip through this quickly to so try to finish the deck real fast. Um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll skip this slide because we're, we're running low on time. But uh, yeah, it gives you quite a bit of advantages in the, in the aquatic side, a lot of reduced water usage, uh, particularly for island nations can be a great way to, to reduce your, your um, run to run water usage compared to other methods. And soil gives you a great place for mycorrhizal networks, terrestrial bacteria, so um, uh, all your wonderful soil supplements just avoid yucca or wetting agents in general. Um, and then um, uh, in, in your top waterings, and it can add ferments as well. You can do a no-till. Um, really is a, a great way that you can um, you know, power through a lot of it. Here's some more pictures, uh, different grow in Oklahoma of a very, very happy dual root zone plant. You can see just the massive healthy root growth on that, both above and below the soil line. And this gives you a breakdown kind of how the, uh, the flood and drain layer works. You want to make sure there's an air gap. Uh, and as the water goes up and down, uh, this creates a diaphragm action that uh, uh, flushes the air up through the soil. Uh, and uh, pulls fresh air back down through the soil and getting fresh air to uh, the entire root system, kind of like a lung or a diaphragm. And this gives us very rapid root growth and rapid microbial replication. Your five controls of dual root zones are you can dose nutrients into the water, you can dose nutrients into the soil, you can create um, super soil mixes that are time release uh, for your soil, you can foliar your spray, or you can change up your fish food. Remember, higher protein fish food is gonna create a lot more nitrogen. Uh, if you go more towards herbivorous friendly foods, uh, you'll have a lot more uh, phosphorus and, and, and other nutrients. So uh, definitely something to check out. And then here's a, an example of dual root zone plants. Uh, these ones are for DWC. Um, I would also suggest having done this now on a, on a little bit bigger scale, uh, this worked great for this, but I would also instead, the one thing I would do differently is put kind of a cross oh, uh, across the bottom of it here, either with stick or, you know, bamboo or just cut it so that there's maybe four openings instead of one big opening just to support the weight of the plants, if, especially if you're growing mothers. Sometimes they can get quite heavy and start to push their way down through the bottom of the pot. Um, so uh, that can be a problem. And some of the earliest runs we did in aquaponic cannabis and dual root zones back in Colorado uh, many, many moons ago uh, with uh, Robbie. Uh, uh, out in, yeah, in Colorado it was fun. Here's some, some more recent commercial uh, aquaponic dual root zone plants. Uh, the left here is uh, uh, media bed ones. This one on the right here is Marty's, one of, one of Marty's nicer ones. And the left here is a grow from Oklahoma from this year using uh, fish nutrients quite amazing. And then right here is uh, another picture of a dual root zone DWC this time. Again, uh, hard to argue with canopy that looks like that. Just incredible uniform growth. And uh, we were, again, this, this particular room here was generating over 15,000 clones a week uh, in terms of uh, actual production. So you, you can really crank out the numbers, uh, in, you know, especially if you're doing uh, that type of business model uh, of clone reselling, it really is absolutely unparalleled in terms of production. I'm pretty consistently putting out 15 to 30 clones every three to four days on per mother plant. So, okay. yeah. So, some other common do's and don'ts um, uh, pH up. Uh, highly recommend potassium silicate, potassium bicarbonate, and calcium carbonate. It really is. The, the best uh, combination for pH up. Um, potassium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide only add one nutrient and not two uh, that are plant beneficial as the hydroxide doesn't really become plant beneficial in any way. Uh, and the calcium carbonate again, while beneficial is not as useful as potassium bicarbonate in terms of uh, improving alkalinity or, or otherwise supplementing the system. Uh, speed of growth, again, these pictures were taken 23 days apart. And just to give you an idea, the, the top ones versus the bottom. Uh, again, the speed of growth you get is, is just unmatched. 
more runs per year. Again, we can hit five, six runs, even seven runs, depending on the cultivar uh, uh, increase in, or absolutely double the speed of growth in veg uh, and, and reduce flowering times anywhere from five days to 21 days, depending on the, the flowering length of the cultivar. So I'm also working on some other methods right now to exploit some, some other potential uh, uh, things that we might be able to adjust to even further reduce those um, uh, and, and you know shave off even more time uh, we have some new stuff we're working on that uh, hopefully be, pre be presenting next year that's it's going to be a, kind of a bit of a breakthrough in that direction which i'm pretty stoked about uh, mushroom co2 can also be added uh, the bottom here where the blue is is, is fish tanks these are mushrooms that we grew uh, in colorado with a gentleman named nick arnold uh, if you need his contact info i'm happy to put you in touch with him but uh, you can do a fully sustainable business models incorporating even your co2 into a sustainable uh, uh, part of your production. Super labs, um, we'll, we'll skip through, but uh, uh, basically uh, lab, lactobacillus um, uh, isolating phycocyanin to increase plant production. Phycocyanin is used to create your chlorophyll groups. Um, yeah, uh, we just don't have time to, to cover it in depth, but here's a picture of it, neon blue. Uh, maybe we'll cover some of this in the, in the lunch break if we have a little extra time. Um, uh, plant labs again um, you know what we'll, we'll just cover some of this at, at lunch so we'll kind of drop it here at the mushrooms and skip to the end here um, one thing I did want to mention is the nutrient the true nu nutrient subscription service um, Roger and I from true aquaponics have partnered up to do an all-in-one nutrient testing and uh, nutrient delivery subscription so uh, you send us your water we test it and um, we'll send you a tear open nutrient solution that you can pour into your system and not have to know chemistry or dosing or weigh anything at all um, as long as you can fill a bottle of water uh, you're, you're good to go so uh, check that out if you're looking for kind of an easy solution or you're an aquaponic cannabis grower and you're struggling with your nutrients, um, you know, be sure to check that out. Uh, and then uh, for more information on myself, uh, I have a book coming out next year called Aquaponacea. I was hoping to get it out this year, but uh, between uh, COVID and losing my mother and some other crazy life events that happened in the last couple of months, uh, I have not had time to finish it. So um, it is going to come out next year. Um, you can check it out. Uh, check me out on the Potent Products YouTube channel. Uh, on uh, the Growing With Fishes podcast, um, email at potentponics at gmail.com. Um, website is potentponics. And uh, Marty and I also have a joint uh, aquaponic cannabis class that uh, will be on sale now through uh, Black Friday, or actually now through the end of November. Uh, you can check that out at 8pmjclass.com. We've been recording a long format class that is uh, quite a few days long now. I think we're over five days of, con of, of solid content. So um, with, with video from all over the world, different grows and, uh, and lots of great in-depth coverage from stuff that we've been doing. And then the Facebook group, which is the largest community of aquaponic cannabis growers, uh, facebook.com slash groups slash APCANA or aquaponic cannabis growers. All righty, go ahead. Marty, did you have the yeah, question? So, yeah, the question's from chat. What, uh, what are some of the cons of aquaponics? I would say the biggest con is upfront cost. You're gonna spend on average two to, yeah, about two to two and a half times what it would cost to set up a similar size soil grow uh, for, for a you know, similar type facility in terms of equipment costs, you know, your tanks and your plumbing and stuff like that just gets a little bit of, uh, depending on the scale. Uh, can be a little bit pricey. It's probably the biggest downside. Um, other than that, uh, I think that's probably the biggest thing I can think of. Cool. I mean, I would have to agree. I would have to say <clears throat> just the added element of, you know, of aquaculture, I guess, uh, you know, all the things that have to do with fish are things that you, you know, you have to keep them alive and happy. And sometimes that adds complication. I would say that's probably the biggest, at least learning curve. I don't know if that's a con or not, because I really enjoy the fish now. Uh, so second question is, is flushing needed? No, uh, flushing is not needed. Uh, although I would back off of, you know, I wouldn't go balls to the wall, heavy supplementation in the upper part of the roots and all the way to the end. But even when we're supplementing, we're not supplementing a lot. You know, most of our supplementations are, in the three to 500 total PPM range uh, for people that are used to hydro. So we're not, 
we're not adding all that much. We're just kind of fixing what the fish water can't provide really. Um, and then maintaining microbial health in that upper root zone via whatever supplements that needs. You know, again, it, yeah. it's... I would agree. Uh, flushing is kind of one of those weird terms where people define it differently. So some people say different things at different times. So uh, next question um, might help to give sugar to the microbes though. Absolutely, yes. So if you're doing fermentation, um, then, then go with brown sugar uh, or raw sugar. Uh, or if you're doing microbial mixes and you want something fast, if you're doing something for more of a, a com compost inoculant or something you're going to put into a long-term living soil bed or a hugel bed, then go with the molasses. But anything for fermentation or compost tea brewing or anything like that, or rapid microbial growth, always go with sugars. Uh, over uh, the the molasses because you'll you'll get a much better response and and faster micro microbial replication significantly faster. Cool. Somebody also asked, uh, how do you mineralize exactly? Sure. So mineralization. Let's see if we go back here. Oh, sorry. Set my alarm for myself. Um, do we have any? Okay, so mineralization. So you can see here in these brew tanks, they're the same as a compost tea brewer. So we take the fish waste, we throw it all in there until it's about a third-ish full uh, in the in the tank. And then we, we top it off with water and then we'll add some molasses, uh, usually some IMO, uh, a liquid IMO or, or even IMO2, just a scoop of it right in there. Uh, and then we'll also add any supplemental nutrients. If I know the system needs something, we'll add some of that with, you know, in a lower level, to the to the micro mix, or I'll add potassium silicate to boost the new, the pH back up, or or whatever it is I need to add to supplement to, to fix things. Um, we'll add it to that, and then brew that for three to five days, or even fourteen days, or even in some cases thirty days, um, and then shut that off. Allow the solids to settle for a few hours, and then siphon off the clear water on the upper portion above the solids, and that gives us this heavily heavily mineralized and heavily enriched uh, mineralized water that can that, that can greatly help uh, your, your plants. And that's how we unlock the, the nutrients from the fish waste. Great. Yeah, uh, aerobic microbes and air, lots of both. Uh, yeah. So, and then the last question here, could you explain the advantages of running your system with a water pump versus an air pump? Yeah, so um, you can run the system by an airlift. Uh, the flow rates are just not there. Um, and uh, when you scale it, I've actually seen it where you have too much aeration and it starts to artificially buffer the pH. Uh, so uh, in fact, I was at a, a large grow in Texas where they had managed to do that. So um, that what was not cannabis actually, uh, full disclosure, um, uh, in Texas at least. Uh, anyways, so that one uh, was a problem. So um, definitely something that you have to, to be mindful of. You can actually overdo it with aeration, but uh, I don't like using airlifts. I would only use an airlift maybe in an extreme situation, but even then by the time to get the same flow rates um, to match, you might as well use electric. You know, it's just not worth it. All right, um, anything else? All righty, I think we're gonna uh, get started here with our next guest. Um, uh, I think we'll do our first giveaway though, real quick before we do that. We actually have a, uh, some mammoth pea microbes. I think we'll uh, grab somebody at a chat here before we switch to the next speaker. Uh, make sure I got everything pulled up. Again, sorry for the uh, switch on the link there. Um, Marty, did you got somebody that's participating quite a bit in chat? Uh, yeah. Let's see. Grow uh, a mushroom size of grow of a mushroom grow as it does your canopy space. So if you have uh, ten thousand square feet of cannabis, you need five thousand square feet of mushrooms. So um, you know it's scales maybe not the the greatest but you can certainly uh, make quite a bit of profit and uh, move to a fully sustainable model if it's something that you want to do um, and this design here at the bottom you can see he's got the fish tanks across the bottom here and that's where the tilapia are those actually are sunk down further into the ground 
uh, below that. Uh, and then these chambers are above where these columns uh, hang. This allows them to take advantage of the high humidity in here and open these panels up to harvest uh, while allowing the CO2 to build up and then be uh, periodically vented off uh, from there and the incubation chambers, which are on the other side of the wall behind where he is. Um, so they had CO2 sensors in, in a set of ventilation that allowed that to build up and then vent off uh, into the, the actual grow area uh, periodically uh, as needed. Uh, so it was kind of tricked to something different. I want to show you guys kind of what, what's possible. You know, you can think way outside the box and really incorporate some things that maybe you, you just never dreamed you could actually incorporate with an aquaponics system and, and benefit from, you know, actually make money from your, your CO2 usage instead of having it be a cost and, and things like that. Uh, this is another great thing that we've been, I've been using for a couple of years now and, and really kind of went public with here in the last couple of months is Super Labs, uh, what I affectionately call Super Labs. It looks beautiful, nice blue color. Um, but this is using lactobacillus ferment to uh, break down uh, key, uh, spirulina and kelp uh, into phycocyanin isolate and other uh, plant essential nutrients uh, and compounds that the plants really love. To, to utilize to boost both terpenes and uh, improve overall plant growth and help with plant repair. If you have a damaged plant, a hailstorm, something, I don't know, something's getting munched on or just whatever. Um, it's, it's really good for healing a damaged, stressed out or otherwise screwed up plant and getting it back to normal as fast as possible. Um, uh, again, you wanna use uh, around four gallons of milk. Uh, you wanna inoculate it with kefir, inoculate it with your lactobacillus inoculant uh, and then add uh, four cups of spirulina and two cups of kelp, uh, mix it all together, and then let it sit with a lid on it for you know, anywhere from seven to 14 days, depending on the temperature uh, of your room, uh, generally 10 to 14 days for most batches. And you'll end up with this beautiful blue liquid uh, that is neon blue, just a color that you can't, can't really hardly fathom with your eyes. Um, you can also use this beautiful blue, uh, which is the phycocyanin isolate, as your, um, your dye. If you're into tie dye or you're just into natural food dyes uh, and you wanna dye your clothing and things like that, this can be a great option for um, uh, you know, blue dye in particular. Um, but, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful compound. Now we strain off the, the blue layer, you'll have the cheese uh, at the top You'll have a, a, a blue whey layer at, uh, right below that. And then below that, you'll have your regular whey layer. Uh, you're gonna siphon off that blue whey layer uh, and um, utilize that uh, in a one to 750 to one to 1000 um, uh, dilution rate uh, for your, uh, you know, either direct dosing into the water or into the soil or as a foliar, foliar inoculant. Uh, the other thing I was going to touch on too, um, while we still have a few minutes left, is plant labs. Um, so plant labs uh, utilize, in the same way that we did lactobacillus here uh, with the, the kelp and spirulina, you can use plants. So you can use uh, stinging nettle, you could use um, horsetail, you could use um, um, kudzu, you could use whatever, uh, comfrey, you could use whatever is growing in the area. And, um, uh, and ferment them in a ratio that would unlock uh, significant, uh, more, significantly more minerals and compounds and, and terpene precursors than you would with, with other methods. Uh, and, the, and you know, the, this is just one great example of some of the stuff that you can do. No one's really fleshed this out. This is kind of a direction that, yeah, you have some people doing some, some, some compost teas and stuff like that with different stuff. And that goes, you know, there's a pretty storied history of people doing that with, the, with um, natural farming and things like that and, 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 and sustainable farming and, and uh, you know, uh, dem pure and all that stuff, but not so much trying to hybridize it with, with K, uh, K and F and, and the different fermentation methods and break, methods of breaking down nutrients. So uh, by using things like the dynamic accumulator list you can find on Build a Soil uh, or through um, uh, Duke University's website as well, uh, you can utilize things like this as cheat sheets uh, for uh, how to unlock nutrients. You can see here that lamb's quarter is incredibly high in, in potassium and um, um, you know, stinging nettle is high in, in sulfur, but it's also high in, um, uh, but so is purslane is high in sulfur, but for silica, um, uh, stinging nettle is, is the highest for, for, for silica. 
uh, and, and magnesium as well. So again, just goes to show stinging nettle really across the board is, is really awesome. Um, but uh, uh, it just kind of goes to show what, what is your menu? What is your palate? What, what, what are my bottles I can choose from for, for making nutrients? Or what are my mineral compounds from making my nutrient solution? And this is where some, you know, some of these existing dynamic accumulator stuff can kind of be used in and, and taken from it. And you're going to unlock different ratios by using lactobacillus and, uh, and, and instead of an FPJ, or uh, maybe even uh, some of the other methods that you use to break them down. Um, uh, you can, again, further, further utilize these to, to unlock things that you never had. So think of KNF more as like a machine that you can input inputs into and all those different methods are different machines uh, in the factory that can then convert plant inputs into uh, other types of plant outputs um, that can then be utilized as fertilizers. So just something to think about in, in that way. And then um, we talked a little bit about this before, but just the, the nutrient subscription service, if you are having problems, uh, I won't touch on it again, but uh, we do have that available.